And uh, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to a passage, if you would please, in the book of 1 John. And we'll look at something that I hope will help you. I want you to hold your Bible open to 1 John chapter 3 and then turn back to John chapter 17. The gospel according to John chapter 17. There's one gospel, not three gospels. So there's a gospel according to the gospel record, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. So John is the same human author, human penman, we might more appropriately say, who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the book of the Revelation, and the gospel according to John. That's five books, which you're well aware of, I'm sure. And uh, let's try to sit up with a, a right angle on your back. It's all good for you that way, so you can breathe properly and uh, move forward. How about it? Very good. Now, when Jesus was praying what we call the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, I want you to notice the first three verses, then we'll go to 1 John. In John chapter 17, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, to as many as thou hast given him. Now notice he brings up the subject of eternal life in verse 2 here, as he's praying, as he begins his prayer, and the fact that God gives eternal life. All right? I'm trying, I've tried three times to wear this kind of glasses. Now I'm trying, this is the, my third attempt. And so you pray that I'll be patient enough to learn how to do this. Any of you need patience? Yeah, all right. The third verse, he's going to give eternal life. Notice in verse 2, he should give eternal life to his ministry house given him. So we're given, to, we're given to the Lord Jesus. He gave himself for us. We are a gift from God the Father to him. You ought to put that down somewhere because you'll understand the new covenant that way. That's the New Testament. Because the covenant is between God the Father and God the Son. And we enter into it. It's not between God and man. When we say New Testament, that means New Covenant. The Old Covenant or Old Testament. The New Covenant or New Testament. Now, this was sealed in the blood of Jesus through His death, burial, and resurrection, but it's between God the Father and God the Son, that all who come to God by faith in the Son, the Father will give the Son. And that's how Jesus prays here. Let me read it again, verse 2. As thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given Him so we have been given to Christ. That's why he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So how safe are you? If you truly know the Lord, how safe are you? See? Now the third verse that we have is the third verse. Of course, when the Bible was given to us, it was not given to us in chapters and verses. This was devised so that we might be able to use Bible tools to find the verse and the chapter. And so often sometimes we, we miss the sentence structure in all of this. Verse 3 and this is life eternal. Now this is the great definition for eternal life. That they might know thee, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is life eternal. You see that? Do you have life eternal? Now, we talked to this class the first semester about how people come to have life eternal. Following Christ and fishing for men, leading people to Christ. How many of you were led to Christ by a personal soul winner? Not your parents, but a personal soul winner. Would you raise your hand, please? How many of you were led to Christ by your parents? Would you raise your hand? How many of you are led to Christ by a friend? How many of you listened to someone preach? And as you listened to someone preach, God spoke to your heart, you responded to the preaching of God's Word, and you came to know the Lord as your Savior. How many of you have read something and came to the Lord? I mean, it's a gospel track or a book or a piece of literature. <clears throat> That's great. That's great. How many of you came to the Lord some other means than which I've been talking about? By some other means. All right. Uh, tell me what that is. Okay, Vacation Bible School. Good. How many of you were saved in Vacation Bible School? Some special children's meeting or youth meeting? All right. How about you? Speak up so I can hear you. Your younger brother led you to Christ. Well, that's great, isn't it? Usually it's the other way around, isn't it? That's great. But you came to Christ. You remember in John chapter 3, a man came to Jesus under the cover of darkness. His name was Nicodemus. And Jesus said unto him, Marvel not. So he, he understands that this man is going to be sort of shocked by what he's going to say. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Thou must be born again. See, we're dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, a dead man can't make himself come back to life, can he? That's why salvation is of the Lord. It's not just a conversation you have with people and they talk to you about the Lord and you say, well, they convince me. Well, the Holy Spirit has to do a work in your heart. You ever doubt that? I did. How many of you ever doubted and you wondered, I got to get this straight? Got confused or didn't get real assurance? Or, would you lift your hands? Good. It sort of helps you to say, I did, right? I noticed a while ago when I said, How many of you ever doubted? No, there was no response. And I said, I did. Then half the room raises his or her hand. You know? But I, I was led to Christ, and then I followed the Lord in baptism. But I did not live the Christian life as I should have lived it. As a matter of fact, it was about 18 months of my life as a teenager. I came to Christ uh, shortly before my 14th birthday. But I did not live the Christian life from that point on like I should have lived it. It was about an 18-month break in there. I didn't lose salvation, but I just got with the wrong crowd. They weren't church going. Nobody else in my house went to church, you know. I didn't get bored with it. Matter of fact, the Lord wouldn't leave me alone. God just kept dealing with my heart about things. Has the Lord ever dealt with your heart about something when you were like sort of fleeing from God or from what God wanted? Has He? And He troubles you? Look, please. That's, that's evidence that you're a Christian. If you can go on that way and never be troubled, never think about it, you think the devil would trouble you? I mean, he wants you to go to hell anyway, so why is he going to try to shake you up about whether or not you're saved? Right? That's not going to happen. So he has a different mode of operation. All right? God dealt with me because... I was a possessor of something or someone. This is life eternal that we might know Him, the only true God. So He came to live in me. We are present possessors of eternal life if we know Jesus as Savior. 
Now, here's what this course, as we call it, this course is about. And uh, here, here's what I want you to write down. It is about living eternal life now. Living eternal life now. Don't you think people get the idea that one of these days they're going to live eternal life when they see Jesus and get to heaven? Don't you sort of think people think that way? Would someone nod his or her head just to make me think I've said something that's true? I know that. It's like some people get the idea who are even witnessing, and I, I, have, a little, uh, I have a little problem with this kind of witnessing. I don't have a little problem. I have a big problem with it. Is that you, you try to lead someone to Christ, and, and that person makes a profession of faith, and then you think, well, we're finished now. We'll see you in glory. No. It's about living the Christian life now. Now. Do you have it? And if you have it, would you raise your hand? All right. Now, how do you live it? That's what this whole business in this course is about. How we live the Christian life. Now, I've given you a book. <laughs> well, you purchased it. I wrote it. You purchased it. Thank you. And <clears throat> uh, it's called Truths Every Christian Needs to Know. Now, you will have to teach that to someone. Now, that's the biggest shock some of you have ever had because you think it's hard enough for me to read it. You mean I have to teach it? Yes. So you have to qualify yourself to teach that to someone by finding someone to teach it to in the next week, within the next week. How many of you think you understand clearly what I said just now, whether you do it or not? Would you raise your hand? Good. That's good. I'm going to tell you why in just a moment because I, I want you to really get it, okay? Then I gave you, excuse me, you purchased a book. And it is a, a biography of a great man that God used in a wonderful way. And I want you to read it. It'll stir your heart. It'll stir your heart for God, for the things of God. There's no doubt about it. Now, there's another book that you've purchased that we have never used before, but every student had to get it. At least I hope you got it. It's called Believe and Belong. It's the Joy of Church Membership. How many of you are familiar with what I'm talking about? Okay. Now, you can teach either book you want to teach. You can teach Truths Every Christian Needs to Know or The Joy of Church Membership. One may be a little more appropriate than others. Now, there are people in our youth group in our church. There are people that are single adults in our church. There are new converts. There are families. There are people here in this church that you can teach this to. Most of the time, people wonder, where am I going to find someone to teach this to? I'm going to help you with that. There's a student guide for these books, a study guide they can use. It's not expensive at all. Then you read the book and use your Bible. Read the book, use your Bible, and then you're going to teach it to someone. Now, let me tell you a little secret. We're going to go to this passage in 1 John in just a moment, so don't lose it. Let me tell you a little secret. I want you to be able to define eternal life. Eternal life. What is eternal life? I want you to write the question down. What is eternal life? And then I want you to answer it this way. Write down John chapter 17, okay, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That's, God says this is life eternal. So you're going to be intelligent as a Christian. You're going to have something that you know how to explain. You can tell someone, I'm a Christian. I have eternal life. Now, I'm going to give you just a little clue here that's going to help you because before we finish the class, all of you are going to be speaking to someone telling them this. So you need to remember it. Eternal life, write it down, please. Eternal life is the life. Eternal life is the life of the eternal one 
Eternal life is the life of the eternal one living in me. Eternal life is the life of the eternal one living in me. Let's say that together. I want all of your beautiful faces to be operating here, okay? Some of you know exactly when I'm looking at you, don't you? All right, here we go. Eternal life is the life of the eternal one living in me. Let's say it just the fellas. Eternal life is the life of... All right, ladies, eternal life. All right, who is the eternal one? God, that's good. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. We're going to talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want you to write this expression down. The Godhead. God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The simple expression, three in one. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see three gods. Now that's very difficult. We'll talk, talk more about it. They are, would you write this down? They are coexistent. They exist together. They are co-equal. One is not greater than the other. Coexistent, co equal. They are eternally existent. So if I speak of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, I'm speaking of God. They're co equal, co existent, eternally existent. In other words, some people believe God the Son started at the Incarnation. And they teach that. But I don't believe the Bible teaches that, and I'm going to show you the Bible doesn't teach that. He did not begin in Bethlehem. He had no beginning. When we say that God is eternally existent, do you have that written down? Do you have that written down? Good. That means we don't believe he ever had a beginning. He is the eternal one. Now, if you have eternal life, eternal life is what? Come on. Is the life of... That's right. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what Paul wrote. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Does it ever trouble you that we talk about the eternal one? Just lift up your head and look a moment. Living in me, God eternal, creator God, co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Does it ever trouble you that we talk about God in us, yet we live such weak, anemic Christian lives? That's why we're having this course on living the Christian life. I want you to write it down again. I know you've written it once. This course is on living eternal life now. Living eternal life now. Now here's a question. Write it down, please. When do I receive eternal life? When do I receive eternal life? You're 
Ask you this of yourself. When do I receive eternal life? Answer. You want to write down answer? When I receive the eternal one. I receive eternal life when I receive the eternal one. Oh, I'm having a good time talking about this. I hope you're having a good time listening to this. Because you need to talk to people about this. You need to talk to people about this. And you're going to talk to people about this. Or you're not going to pass the course. (laughs) So, isn't that good? All right, so write this down, please. Eternal life. Eternal life is the present possession. Eternal life, eternal life is the present possession of every Christian. Eternal life is the present possession of every Christian. Now let's go to a funeral home for a moment. I'm going to pick up a little thing like they have at the funeral home that tells who died and when they died and when they were born. I pick it up. And most funeral homes are going to write on that little piece of thing they give you, a little bulletin they give you. They're going to say, entered into eternal life, and they're going to give the day of death. Look for yourself. Entered into eternal life, and they give you the day of death. Is that when that person, if that person was a Christian and is a Christian, Is that when that person entered eternal life? Yes or no? You learn something. Now when you go home from kindergarten today and your mother says, what did you learn in school today? You tell them what you've learned. Eternal life is the present possession of every Christian. Now I wanted to say every true Christian. But there's no such thing. And I'll find myself saying that sometimes. We qualify Christians. He's a real Christian. He's a true Christian. What we mean by that is they're living the Christian life. But either you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. Let's say it this way. Let's imagine there's a coffin here. Look, please. There's a casket here. And beside it, there's another casket. And there are bodies in each casket. There's a body in each casket. You got the picture? And I'm coming by and I'm looking down in the body in each casket. And you hear me say, that man's dead. Then I go over here and say, that man's really dead. (laughs) You see how silly that is? Isn't that silly? So I say to you, he's a Christian. He's really a Christian. No, you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. Right? What do you think? Yes? Good. That's right. You're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. So the life, the eternal one living in me, that's eternal life. Okay? Somewhere put Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 just so you can remember. And you hath he quickened. That means made alive. Quickened means made alive. Quickened. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, let me take you to 1 John, if you'll turn there. 1 John chapter 3. I have a book with this title. And uh, I was just going over again how many times life appears in this little book. But look at 1 John chapter 3. And let's look at verse 14. We know, that's a great word, isn't it? We know, what if it said, we think, we imagine, we feel like. You know, that's right. There, there is nothing there for us in that. We know that we have passed from death to unto life. We know that we pass from death unto life. How many of you know 
that you have passed from death unto life. How many of you know you were dead in trespasses and sins? All right. Jesus said you must be born again. Nicodemus had to have explained to him. Am I, I mean, do you mean, do you mean I, I have to go into my mother's womb and come out again? Now that sounds like a silly question to us because we've heard, well, what do you mean by being born again? You were born once physically. You must have a second birth that's spiritual. And he went on to explain that to this, this very religious man. This man was so religious, this, this Pharisee, Nicodemus, he was so religious, he wouldn't need, need an egg if a chicken laid it on the Sabbath because he considered that the chicken had to work to lay the egg. Well, he was religious. But it didn't help him. Matter of fact, it could have greatly hindered him about salvation, couldn't it? So we know that we have passed from death unto life. Now wait a minute. Oh, here's an evidence. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. In other words, you're still dead. You're still dead if you can't love your brother. Is that because of my ability to love? And we're talking about others in, in the Lord here. Is that because of my ability to love that person? Or, the, or because, look please, look, 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 look. Or because of the eternal one living in me, enabling me to love that person. Let me ask you something. What does the Bible say in John 3.16? Let's just start it. Don't finish it. For God. Wonderful. Who lives in you? God. All right. God the Holy Spirit. But he's co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father, God the Son. We're speaking truly of God when we say the Holy Spirit. All right. If he lives in you, does God love that person? Can God love that person through you? Yes. And so it's an evidence that you're a Christian. It's an evidence that you're a Christian. What did Jesus say about those who even crucified him? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Yes. So we're going to talk about how to live the Christian life. How do we live the Christian life? It is living what? Eternal life when? Now, let's try it. It is what? Living eternal life now. Living eternal life now. Now, how does somebody get eternal life? How many of you have been with us following Christ, fishing for men, trying to lead people to Christ, talking about how we give the gospel? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The Jew first and also the Greek. It is the power of God that brings salvation unto salvation. So here's a person who's heard the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and the message of salvation. The Holy Spirit's drawn that person to Christ. That person has opened his or her heart, repented of sin, and trusted Christ as Savior. Now the Lord Jesus comes to live in. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even then that believe on his name. So, it's a child of God now. He's a child of God? Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, he has eternal life. What do you mean by that? He has the eternal one living in him. What do you mean by that? He's passed from death. We know we've passed from death unto life. How do you know he's passed from death unto life? Well, one of the things, and many things, but one of the things, he loves the brethren. Now, loving the brethren didn't pass him from death unto life. We just know he's passed from death unto life because he's now got love for the brethren. That's just one of the things. How many of you are still with me? Good, good. Well, praise God.
living eternal life now.